thank you, thank you for coming this evening. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you all for, for being here. And on behalf of the UNM School of Architecture uh, and Planning, as well as the Ford Brook Foundation, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, my name is John Qualley. I'm a professor of architecture, and I'm the chair of the architecture department. And I'm also lucky enough to be the person to be the director of the Jeff Harner Award. Um, tonight is a very special occasion in our school. Uh, over the last several years, we've had the pleasure to host and manage the Jeff Harner Award for Contemporary Architecture in New Mexico. The Harner Award is conceived by Garrett Thornburg, who's standing right there. individual who truly believes in the future of contemporary architecture. Garrett is uh, chairman of Thornburg Investment Management, uh, worldwide, it's kind of going in and out here, uh, a worldwide investment company based in Santa Fe, and also chairman of the Thornburg, Thornburg Foundation, tonight's sponsor. The headquarters of the Thornburg Investment Management, uh, of Thornburg Investment Management, was designed by noted Mexican architect, Ricardo Lagareta. So he's got good taste. <laughs> um, Garrett is someone who care, who deeply values innovation and is an avid supporter of contemporary architecture. It is through his generosity that we are able to host remarkable guest speakers like Hugo Maria. Thank you. We're always committed to trying to recognize outstanding new projects and inspiring new talents in New Mexico. That's what the Jeff Harner Award is all about. So Garrett is with us this evening, and I would like to invite him to give a few remarks about why he established the Jeff Harner Award uh, for Contemporary Architecture. designed my house that I live in, and he built it the first time in 1988, and I'm still there. He remodeled and expanded it in 1993. He remodeled and expanded it again in 2002 and added a guest house, which I don't know if it's in the slides up here, but it's a little jewel box of a design. And we, were, we became really close friends through this process, and we became fly fishing buddies and everything else, and unfortunately, you know, at the age of 51, he had a kidney failure, and he died on the operating table in Colorado. And uh, he was just hitting his stride. He'd done so many remarkable buildings, and he had to you are doing this here the first time ever, unbuilt structures. He did an unbuilt structure in the house, Key Valley, that was astounding. I saw the plans for it. I don't remember who was going to build it, but they ultimately didn't build it, but it was, like, amazing. And so through that, I really came to love contemporary architecture through Jeff and watch him battle with the historical hysterical society in Santa Fe. Uh, and uh, also in Santa Fe, for example, if you drive downtown, you'll see the uh, very famous Anazazi Hotel, which gets all kinds of kudos. That used to be the state securities building. It's a steel frame building. It had metal in the walls inside, you know, like Kojak's offices, green up to the sides. Uh, and I happen to have an office across the street and I watched them put in the beams at the very top, which they built a two by four frame covered with chicken wire. Then they put in beams that were about four feet long, sticking out, so it looks like it had bigas in this steel building uh, from the street. Even Disney, when they built an Adobe building in Disney World, actually used Adobe. So we're more fake than Disney. <laughs> uh, and so I really appreciate what people are doing with modern materials. What he didn't mention is our Legoretta office building is another amazing work of art, but it's also a gold green building, uh, which is not so hard to achieve these days. Uh, and uh, some of the innovations in that are amazing, like the floor system with the air heating and cooling under the floor paid for itself in three years. Um, but I really became to appreciate the modern architecture through Jeff and getting the opportunity. I'm really, really lucky. I get to live in and work in two works of art. I like to collect art as well, but I'm telling you to be able to be in those environments is really a special feeling. And I, that's what I so love about architecture, and I go 
visit buildings all over the world just for the fun of it. So I hope you enjoy this tonight. But I did this in Jeff's honor because I think his career was got really, really short and he would have done some more amazing buildings, but we're going to see other people's amazing buildings tonight. Thank you, John. created to recognize a single work of contemporary architecture completed within the past five years in New Mexico that furthers the ideals of Jeff Hardy. It is not required that the architect or architecture firm are from New Mexico, but the building must be completed in the state. So, um, in addition, I want to mention that this is our jury here, um, and I'm going to call out your names. Um, we've got Aaron Zahm here. He's a landscape architect here in, uh, in Albuquerque. We've got Pima Wakefield, who many of the students will know. She's a senior. Uh, we've got Yuko Nakayama, who is already speaking. Jury chair, in addition to being our speaker this evening. Um, and then we have E.B. Min, who runs a wonderful firm in San Francisco. And last but not least, we have Corey B., who uh, is uh, and also on the faculty of the uh, University of Texas at Austin. So um, the, the, I, the other thing I wanted to mention, in addition to the Jeff Harner Award is that we also have added an unbuilt category this year, and I just want to give you a little background on that, and then we're going to announce the winners. So, um, a year ago, Executive Director Jen Fenstermacher, where is Jen? Is she in here? No, she's hiding in the back, as usual. Um, she gave me the winning unbuilt design board that Garrett mentioned. Um, she found it in the archives of the Albuquerque AIA, uh, um, I don't know, closet, I'm guessing, or storage facility. <laughs> and um, it was submitted um, in that category and it won the Merit Award, the top award for Unbuilt that year. And while I was familiar with Harner's work, I had never seen this interesting project. Um, some of you may have noticed that it's been put, that Jeff's board is on the Crick Bridge outside. So when you go up to the exception, you can see the actual board and uh, see this work. Um, and it started to see in my mind that knowing that Jeff Harner had won an unbuilt award, that maybe it was time for the Harners, uh, the Jeff Harner Award to include an unbuilt award. Um, so I firmly believe that for the profession of architecture to continuously evolve, it depends upon visionary designers willing to push boundaries of design. So I really want to thank the Thornbrook Foundation for your willingness to support this idea uh, because I think it's important to recognize not just built work, but the potential of built work from an amazing group of designers who submitted uh, this year. Um, so uh, I also want to, um, Yuko is going to announce the winner in a second, but before I do that, I want to give you some background on Yuko. And maybe I should just give up on this thing, because it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, let me introduce uh, Yuko. Um, I want to first clarify that this evening, um, Yuko is a native Japanese speaker. Um, she has English as well, but she felt more comfortable, rather than her delivering the lecture in a conventional way, she has asked uh, her friend Kana, who is fluent in English, um, to take Yuko's lecture translated into English, and it's been pre-recorded. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. Um, it, it does mean that we know exactly how long the lecture takes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so it, it's, it's truly Yuko's ideas and Yuko's buildings. Um, but it's spoken by someone else. In addition to that, after the lecture, with some questions and answers, we have Akiko here, um, and she is going to translate for Yuko if there's any 
subtlety to the questions that needs to be uh, communicated. So, um, in terms of Yuko's uh, bio, after graduating uh, with an architecture degree, she worked for noted Japanese architect Jun Aoki, uh, who is really becoming um, something of an international uh, person at this point, I believe. Um, and uh, Aoki mentored Yuko, and she worked in the firm for four years. And in 2002, after only four years, she left and started her own firm, Yuko Nagayama and Associates. And Aoki helped her find her very first building commission, which was a yeah, wonderful the white guy. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Yuko has designed a variety of notable buildings and has become recognized as a rising star in Japan. Early in her career, she won the JCD Design Award Encouragement Prize, an important award in Japan early in one's career, and the United Kingdom's highly commended prize from Architectural Review Magazine for her design of a hill on a house. Not a house on a hill, but a house. You're going to see that tonight. Um, and in 2012, the US magazine Architectural Record named her to the list of design vanguard architects from around the world. She also won the uh, Japan Institute of Architects Young Architect Award for the Teshima Yoku House in 2014, and most recently, the Architectural Cultural Award from Yamanashi Prefecture for the uh, project Goddess of the Forest in 2017, another project you will see um, uh, this evening. She graduated from Showa Women's University in the Department of Environmental Science and Design, and she is one of a very few number of women-owned architecture firms in Japan. Yuko has also found a way to balance her career with her family, her husband, Akira Ujimo, an artist, and their two young children have joined her on this trip. They're not in the room today. Akira is hopefully feeling better now. <laughs> he was not doing very well last night. Um, so, um, I'd like to welcome Yuko to the stage. Thank you for inviting me to the University of New Mexico. I would like to express my appreciation to the foundation. I have enjoyed my time in New Mexico so far. I also enjoy the discussion with the jurors. All the submissions were wonderful. I am pleased to announce that the winner of the 11th Annual Jeff Anna Award is the building, Site Santa Fe. cannot be here this evening. Um, however, I believe that there are two representatives of, of the client that are with us in the audience. Is that correct? Yes. Please come on down.
So you should stand there in the middle and the group will be around you and I'm going to go off to the side. <laughs> Architects in New York and the lead designer, Ayumi Sugiyama, as well as the board and staff of Site Santa Fe, I am thrilled to accept the Jeff Horner Award for Contemporary Architecture. I just made up some remarks in case, you know, this is my only chance to feel like that happened. <laughs> and I wanted to be kind of prepared and give it due respect. Uh, Shop Architects has created a bold, iconic design to allow Site Santa Fe to showcase the world class contemporary art and its newly expanded and enhanced building in the Santa Fe Rail Yard District. We'd like to thank the Thornburg Foundation for creating and sponsoring the award and the UNM School of Architecture and Planning for managing the process and this event tonight. The Harner Competition has become known as an extremely prestigious award in the architectural profession. Shop architects based in New York City were extremely excited to submit their design for consideration as were we, the board and staff of Site Santa Fe. We're also extremely grateful to Yuko Nagayama of Tokyo, who served as the jury chair of the rest of the talented jury, and John Kwame for uh, the UNM School of Architecture and Planning, who managed this entire project. We invite you all to visit Site Santa Fe to enjoy the fruits of SHOP's talented team. We, do not, uh, we cannot wait to share the new Site Santa Fe with you, so come on up and see us. Thank you very much. And Evie Min. No, I'm sorry, no. Emma Wakefield and Craig Lee. Sorry, I got it in the wrong order. So, Emma, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, gosh, we had such a rough morning today trying to decide who the winners would be. I mean, it was a really talented group of entrants. And I was really happy to see that there were many students who submitted their work for the unbuilt cap category, as well as faculty and professionals from the area. Um, we actually looked at the project for several hours. There were quite a lot of submissions. And the winner. I got the easy job. I got the fun job. So the winner of the unbuilt architecture category is Vertical Cemetery for Extinct Species by UNM Master of Architecture student Darby Prendergast. students and faculty of the Landscape Architecture Department um, to have an opportunity to, to be recognized. So we had a number of student entrants. Uh, we also had some professionals. It was a wide range. So we actually had to spend quite a bit of time deliberating because it was, it was sort of fun to uh, compare and contrast what were um, very disparate works um, in this category. So with that, I'm 
The winner is Murchison Rogers Park, designed by Surrounding Studio. First, I would like to introduce a residency project called Nishi Azabu House, which had a theme of blankness found in a path. This house is located in a crowded area in the center of Tokyo, facing a narrow closed private path. As you can see, the house is consisted of two blocks. The left is made with glass and is designed as a public space. The block on the right is a closed private box. The public box is constructed by steel structure. The private box is constructed by reinforced con concrete. The uniqueness of this project was that within a crowded residential area, you can see the sky through the building, like a blank blank space suddenly appearing within the cramped houses. In the daytime, actually, the glass reflection and vegetation prevents eyesights from outside. You can't see as much as you would think the glass block would allow. In front of the house, across the road, there actually is another building with a white wall standing quite closely, but because of the white colour and the vegetation, it seems as though this house has a nice garden in front of itself. This is a view from the inside. Layer, layers of floor are piled as though a terraced rice field. The more it sets back, the more private the space becomes. Bright sunshine comes in through the glass exterior. This is the view from the second floor. In the middle, you can see the sky in between the buildings of Tokyo. This is a view from the top study room. It gives a unique perspective, as though you were looking down at your own house, within your house. This is the view looking up from the ground floor. Now usually, a space surrounded by glass is actually very difficult to handle, because of direct, direct sunlight, heat, and etc. We solved this problem by using a special kind of glass. Please see the color of the glass on the ceiling. 
it can change its color and char characteristics according to the outside condition. It is called sage glass and is recently being used in many places, for example, the glass windows of aircrafts. It can prevent sunray at 99%, and by preventing sunlight, you can protect the environment of the interior. This is a photograph of the exterior at night. You can see the atmosphere as though warm light is leaking through within the building. This is an exterior photo from the front. This is a view of the rooftop. The next project is a combination of a residential house and a shop. The ground floor is a cake shop. The upper floor is the residence of the cake shop owner. This is a view at night. The current owner's father started the cake shop and when his son took over the business, they decided to renovate the shop. One thing I took in consideration of the design was the distance between the private and the public. The private residency space is built above the store, which is a public space. I inserted a gap, a layer of air, in order to separate the two opposing elements and made a physical and a mental distance to occur. At night, the gap becomes of an iconic view, as though a cake box is opening up. This is a view from inside the cake shop. You can actually see the gap. The space is half facing the outside. The cakes, which are not good to have direct sun, sun ray, is protected by the house, which becomes a shelter. The space facing the road is as though surrounded by a low fence and as though a secret hiding space. I created a space could be viewed by slightly walking up. The upper floor is a private residency. This is a view of the children's room. The side facing the road is protected by a wall, making sure that its privacy is not invaded. The garden is filled with sunlight all year round. This is the kitchen. And this is the view around the window. Now the next project is called A Hill on a House and is one of my first residential projects. The house is located in Shibuya, one of the most crowded areas within Tokyo. The property was surrounded by tall buildings and also facing the north. The entire design started from how should I guide natural light inside the house? Then I came up with the idea of hollowing the entire house and architecturally designing its profile. I tipped the rooftop so it, so it would face the sun towards the south, which then would allow the natural sunlight to make a reflection and deliver the light inside the rooms facing north. This is the rooftop which delivers the natural sunlight. You can see the natural sunlight coming in from the south, shining all white. Here is how the building actually is. It is surrounded by tall buildings around. 
the client had many females in the family, and privacy was an important topic for this project. You cannot see from the outside, but the inside was filled with an open atmosphere. This is a view of the interior. You can see the top light falling on the wall at the back. This is the inner garden. The inner garden and the interior is connected with a flat floor, but is divided by glass. The glass separation is ca causing a hierarchy within the space. When you are at the front, the space behind the glass is blocked and separated by the glass. It creates a ma, a Japanese cognition of space, and creates a moment of not being able to access the other side. This is the bedroom on the upper floor. The large slope is a space where no one can enter and no one can reach. But because of this space, where nobody can physically enter, it actually becomes a space where the mental could be infinitely released. The concept here was creating a place where you could not reach. This image is a photograph of a very famous Japanese garden called Ryoanji Sekitei. In, West, in Western culture, a garden is a place where you go in yourself. But in the Japanese culture, gardens are sometimes places where you cannot enter. The pebbles of this garden are beautifully designed as a wave pattern. And it is not designed as a place to walk in, but only to enjoy its view. The inner garden shown here, divided by the large glass, is also a place where you cannot enter. Because you cannot enter, your imagination can be limitless. It can actually turn into an infinite place. Japanese residences are small, but have their unique distances between the nature. This house may not seem Japanese or Oriental at all at first sight, but the mental philosophy purely incorporates the roots of its culture. The tree, standing on its own, can become an object of mentally freeing one's imagination. This is a view at night. The space incorporates the light designed by the reflection. In daytime, the upper part is bright. At night, the opposite part becomes bright by the reflection. During the daytime, the rooms are bright with the natural sunlight. And at night, the artificial lights make reflections and maintain the interior bright. After three residential projects, I would now like to show more of my public projects. Also, Soupstock is a restaurant specializing in soup. I designed this restaurant in Jiugaoka, Tokyo. One of the characteristics of this area, Jiugaoka, is its very nice atmosphere. There are many lovely and uplifting flagships on the street. And the location of this restaurant is right on the corner of its main street. People walking on the street of Jiugaoka have an atmosphere of enjoying their uplifting time. This is the completed exterior view. You can see the property is nicely on the corner of a lovely road. This is the exterior from the side. The main concept of this project was to make a vertical structure filled with an 
joyful open atmosphere, which would resonate and exemplify the area of Shiugaoka. Everything is visible from outside, and also the seated area on the first floor has its ceiling open up to the second floor, and the seated area on the second floor has its ceiling open up to the rooftop terrace. The seated areas are vertically designed as a nested structure. Another feature of this project are the original window frames. Many people like this view of the many open windows. In order to create this open space, I placed all the technical machineries in the grey box on the right. Air conditioners have outdoor units and indoor units. I created an outdoor environment inside the upper half of the grey box, and then an indoor environment on the lower half of the grey box. And I hid all these mechanical machineries that I did not want to leave visible in the open area. This is a view from a different angle. You can see the many open windows. From the outside, you can look straight in both the first and the second floor. This is the view from the second floor. You can see both the terrace seats above as well as the table seats on the first floor. This is a view from the stairway towards the terrace. It gives you, it gives you the whole perspective of the project. You can see the outside public road on ground level and the first floor seats. This is looking down from the second floor. The road is really close by and the window is usually left open. It is designed as an extension of the joyful public road. Sometimes children walking back from school would walk by on this road. Or when the table is filled with a big group, they may sit on the edge of the table half outside on this public road. This table, half open, half open to public, has become one of the very char characteristic views of this project. This is a view of the open ceiling on the first floor. I placed a horizontal green surface and divided the vertical space into the upper and the lower. The lower is a restaurant and the upper is an art gallery. This is the second floor. The grey wall looks like tiles, but actually it is a concrete wall. The, the effect that looks like tiles was created by special brush strokes of a protective coating applied on the top of the concrete. I asked the special painter to make vertical and horizontal brush strokes, which resulted in creating this pattern, as though they were built with tiles. I worked again with this painter in the next project I will introduce. Now you can see six circles visible on the top, which are where the air conditioning units are connected. Among the six circles, three of them, three of them are for returning air, and the other three are for supplying air. This is the stairway towards the terrace seats. This is how it looks like at night. The artwork has an impression as though it is floating in the air. The next project I will introduce is called Kobuchizawa Hall, and it was built in Yamanashi, which is approximately two and a half hours north from Tokyo. The site is in the middle of a deep forest, at the height of 1,000 meters. The client is one of the major cosmetic companies in Japan. The headquarters is nearby the site, which you can see on the upper, side, upper left in this picture, with some geometric patterns. The headquarters office was designed by Mario Bellini in Italy. The company wanted to have a hall 
where they could have hold lectures towards their clients who buy their cosmetics. But then they realized that there was no other hall in Kobuchizawa, where the local public could use. So this they made this place available for the public to use too. This is the site in detail. It is full of pine trees, and you can see it really is a forest. I wanted to pay respect to this environment. The headquarters office was very masculine, with a heavily male impression. Their request for this new facility was to have a more fem feminine design. Feminine design, which would blend into the nature, and was based on the Japanese philosophy towards nature. I think that was the reason why they selected me. And I actually was pregnant in full term with a huge belly when I got this call. It really was almost the same timing that I gave birth to my first child, and when I made my first proposal of this project. Now I left the surrounding trees as much as possible, so the building would kind of hide inside the forest. The light blue parts in this diagram were all made by glass. As you can see, the basic structure of this facility is three squares, two large and one small, and are connected with a corridor. It is based on a structure called shindenzukuri. Which is a Japanese traditional method in architecture, since the Heian period, which is approximately 1,000 years ago from now. In Shindenzukuri, each room has its own facility, and they are all connected with a corridor. By designing this way, the entire facility does not have to have a huge construction. And then it can more naturally blend in with the natural sur the surrounding nature. The entire facility is designed along the slope of the hill, from upper side to the lower side. Among the three facilities, the hall was the tallest, so it was built at the lowest place. The room with lower height was built on the higher side higher side of the hill. So it would not stand out too much in the forest, because it respect, respected the incline of the slope. Eyesight and also the wind could naturally go through the venue. The corridors were not only designed to walk through, but also became paths for the wind and the eyesight. More detailed paths were designed as well. The large path and the smaller paths created an intimate relation with the forest. The closed rooms were placed in between the large and small paths, paths, as though filling in spaces. The event hall, built on the lower side of the hill, is an event hall with a capacity of seven hundred people. On the higher side, there is a room for multi-purposes, as well as a conference room on the second floor. The road that connects to this facility is divided from a public road. One of the road connects to the whole whole lobby, and the other connects to the entrance of the cafeteria, as though a narrow path in the forest would guide you. This is a view from the from one of the large paths, looking into the event hall at the back of the layer. A view of the small path to the cafeteria. Now the building was built with a very selective material. All materials were designed so it would give a selected texture, as though you take care of your own facial skin. Because the client is a cosmetic company, a forest is a collective of smaller elements. You cannot just build a huge construction 
if you want to make it in harmony with the forest. To make the building itself become more closer to the forest, I looked for materials which had had a greater detailed texture. Here the grey material on the lower right was a concrete board. They had, a, they had brush strokes made by humans on its surfaces, which made an impression that res resembled a wooden branch. The picture on the middle right was the material used for the second floor. The second floor needed a function to block the sunlight, so I created this original herringbone-like pattern, which functioned as a, as a shade. The, the material on the top right was a pattern that was inspired from clouds in the sky. This slide shows the process of making the original patent materials. We researched and made the materials in China. It was as though creating a recipe of patterns by choosing which brush to use in which color and so on. We also decided to reuse some wood materials that were already cut down. Here are the completed patterns. The patterns became stronger in a shadow. The grey image on the upper middle was made by using an existing material with ribs. I overlaid the oblique patterns so it would create the, this unique effect. The image on its right shows how it looks from the inside. The image on the lower left which is the ceiling of the cafeteria, used the same pattern with wood. The image on the right bottom is the hall. The fabric on chairs, as well as the fabric on the wall, use the same pattern. This is a view of the exterior. When you step in from the public road, the path divides into two. Now you go into the facility, the corridor towards the hall, and then you reach the hall lobby. The forest reflects on the floor. The, pe the pebbles used on the floor reflect light, so the forest reflected on the wall will change colours according to the season. Both the back side, as well as the front side of the hall, is surrounded by the forest. The ceiling reflects the forest, as though the surface of water shows reflection. This is the cafeteria. This is also the cafeteria. The ceiling has the original pattern using recycling wood. It seems as though the facility is floating in the sky when you look up from the road outside. This is the corridor outside. This is the shade on the upper floor. It not only shades the sunlight, but also the strong existence of the large hall in front. It is very common in Japan that you cannot see the whole perspective of the building. Here, the perspective of looking at the hall exterior is, object or is objected by this shade. The next project is a facade design of Louis Vuitton Kyoto. This is the completed view of the exterior, fa exterior facade. If you look carefully, you can see the street arcade is dividing the upper half and the lower half. This was a very unique and difficult condition to design. For this project, I fully used the polarizer. In this sample image, there seems a black surface exists in the middle. However, no surface exists there, and it is only an effect of the polarizer that only allows a light 
that only a line allows light of a certain direction. For example, the upper half only allows vertical light, and the lower half only allows horizontal light. So, if you block the vertical and the horizontal, it looks as though a black surface arises. This facade design is created using this effect for its expression. The black patterns may look as though there is a material which makes this visual, but the black is actually a phantom. When you change the direction of viewing, you achieve a different visual experience. This project triggered my interest towards the relationship between architecture and phenomena. Architecture is something that actually exists in reality. But I thought, do architectural materials need to be limited to realistic materials? What if non-materialistic phenomena were used as materials for architecture? Wouldn't that allow unlimited freedom upon expression? In other words, I started to be interested in designs that allow space of interpretation for the viewer. For example, say there was an acrylic, acrylic material with some reflection. To someone, it would be a transparent acrylic, and to another person, it could be functioning as a mirror. The answer does not have to be restricted to one exact conclusion. Its existence should be concluded, concluded each time by the viewer standing and experiencing the sight. This is an image of Ensuji Temple in Kyoto. It is renowned for shakke, the architectural technique called borrowed scenery, where it utilizes the view seen behind and beyond the property. The entire picture comes fulfilled by a person sitting and looking outside. It very much makes sense to me that the site completes only when the viewer, the recipient, the recipient of the site, comes into the view. This Louis Vuitton facade project made me, made me begin thinking of the unlimited potential between architecture and phenomena. The next project is the Kia Ryokan, which was a renovation project. Ryokan is a traditional Japanese hotel. This Ryokan used to operate 150 years ago in the Meiji period, but then was closed for a long time. It is designated as a cultural asset of nation national importance. The property is owned by the municipal city of Uwajima, and is operated by a private sector. This is the completed exterior view. The new Ryokan has an exquisite concept of taking only one group of guests per night. Just one group can have the special experience of staying here. The sole concept for the design was deduction. For example, at times, at, at times, I took off the floor. Only one group, maximum of eight people, would stay at this place. There were plenty of existing floors that I could play with, so I decided to deduct some parts of the floor. After I removed some of the floor, I placed a transparent acrylic board with a with a thickness of one inch. One of the characteristics of Japanese architecture is the horizontal direction. Many of our traditional architectures emphasize on the horizontal impression of space. But by deducting some of the horizontal floor structure, the hidden vertical structures, like this, became unveiled. By the act of deducting, I was able to add additional values and allow visitors to experience this hidden value. 
This is the room where I took out the entire floor and covered with a one inch acrylic board. Because it is an important national cultural property, I was not allowed to touch the basic structures. But taking off the surface materials were feasible. This is a view at night. At night, the floor looks as though it is filled with water. Many guests actually prefer to bring their futon beds here and spend the night sleeping on this acrylic board. It allows a special experience as though floating on the water. In order to create some kind of personal space, I created several shades in each room. The shade comes down from the ceiling. The sitting person in this picture is surrounded by thin white fabric square with blue light lightening from above. You can choose the color of the light from either blue, red, or yellow. This is the view of the bathroom. The geometric white lines on the wall and the ceiling, and the green marbled line on the floor, were actually where I left the old existing materials as is. And then I painted everything left all black. Here again, you can see my concept of the act of deduction. This project actually had a very limited budget, but by putting a strong concept, and featuring the special experience of staying here, I feel I could maximize the values which this property original, originally had. So, in 2013, the same year of the Tashima Yoko House, I organized an art event at this venue. This is the poster of the art event. This is the diagram of the organizers, consisted of three females. I was the organizer who built the venue, and a manga artist called Yoriko Hoshi wrote a special novel for this event. And the artist, Tabaimo, who also has the experience of exhibiting at the Venice Biennale, made, made a video work to the story. The collaboration took place by pa passing the button, which I liked very much. Each artist could fr freely express themselves. Here are some installation views. The well on the screen is the collaborated artwork. The title of the novel was A Stain of Kia. In the story, a family visited Kia and spent one night. We placed some images based on this story in places through, throughout the venue. The shadows on the top is actually a video work and it is not a window. We also placed a screen on the hollowed ceiling. This is the view from beneath the acrylic floor. This is the night view. The art event ran for a month and during that period the hotel accepted guests as usual. This meant the group who could stay who stayed here could enjoy all the art artworks for themselves during their stay. We opened the place to the to the public in the daytime. This is a screen of a creature from the shoji window. During the exhibition period, there was another group exhibition happening as well at a former stationery store. This is its installation view. This is the last project I would like to introduce for this presentation. In a private, it is a private museum of Tadanori Yoko, a very famous Japanese artist within the contemporary art world. He decided to open his private museum on a small island with a population of 1,000 people. 
This is the view of the whole site. It consists of a renovation of three existing buildings, and a large chimney, which was newly built. This is the landscape view you see when walking straight from the main port. The tall chimney is being an iconic sculpture, standing as the highest construction within the town. This is the view from up front. This is the view when you enter the museum. This red color is the characteristic feature of this project. This is the inside. The concept of the whole project was life and death. The site is within the residential area of a remote small island, which means I built this unrealistic place in the middle of a normal residential area. This entrance of the museum became a boundary of the daily life and the unrealistic. I placed this red glass right on the boundary of these two. The inspiration of the red color came to me right after I gave birth to my first son. Tadanori Yoko is an artist renowned for his vivid colors, but by forcing this red filter to be seen by every single person entering the museum, I eliminated all existing colors from everyone. And turned everything into monochrome color, consisted only of red and black. This effect at the entrance allowed all viewers to reset their visual colors and contact your course work with a refreshed state of mind when they step inside. You can see the left part of the picture is left in vivid colors, whereas the right part has eliminated its colors. I was very worried when I first proposed this idea of mine to the artist, as I was literally, literally suggesting to delete his artwork. But surprisingly, he very much liked the idea, and actually was very much inspired by, by it. He started making many suggestions like should I place the red glass here or there and started to create more new paintings and as a result about half of the works in the museum became new works inspired by the new museum itself. This is a view when you step further inside. This is the garden. The whole garden is his installation. All garden stones are red, but the color disappears when it is seen through the red filter. For the main building, I made parts of the glass all black. Black glass make a reflection as though a mirror. You cannot look inside from the outside. In this picture, the black glass is used for the floor, the window, and the ceiling. It is as though you are looking outside from the inside of a sunglass. You can clearly see the outside, which is normally too bright to clearly see. And from the outside, you cannot see the inside because of reflection. This is a view of the same room. Using the black glass on the window, the floor, and the ceiling, seeing from the side. You can see the outside and the sky as though looking through a sunglass. The shadows are weaker because the light has been weakened by the black glass and the room and the room is kind of dim. At the very back, you can see your core's largest artwork. There was a large pillar in this room, which we decided to take out and add steel frames in its surroundings to technically distribute the weight to support the building. 
This is a view at night. The glass floor is causing a reflection, allowing the artworks to make a huge spatial collage. This is another view showing the glass floor causing reflections of the artworks and making a huge collage. This is the entire exterior view from the garden. When you look from outside, you can't tell the colours of the inside. This is the entrance of the chimney. Inside the chimney, there are 9,000 postcards of waterfalls filling the entire wall. On the top and the bottom, there is a mirror, and when you stand there, it feels as though the water well continues forever and ever. This is the close-up view of the postcards of the waterfalls. This is the last exhibition room. This room has a very strong sunlight that comes in from the south. This strong sunlight makes the entire interior filled with red, making even the viewer's clothes almost invi invisible. In this room, I installed a very, very strong light on the artworks, which usually are used for stages. It is so strong that it even can cancel the red colour, and it is used only on the artworks. This is a close-up view. You can see that only the artworks are coming into full colour within the monochrome world filled with red. This painting actually was based on the photograph of the first proposal model of this museum. This was his way of making the layout of this museum. It is very special and quite touching for me. One more thing to add is that this expression became possible only because of the technology in tr transition into LED lights. These strong lights were not possible to be used for permanent installations before because the strong light would cause too much heat. But because everything tr transitioning to LED, I was possible to use this as a permanent installation. This is a site seen through the red window. The artwork reflecting on the right can be seen in full colour. These are images of the site before our renovation. It was built about 80 years ago and then it was left abandoned for over four decades. It was heavily damaged when we started the construction, which you can see here. The museum opened during the Setoichi Triennale in 2013. The Triennale had three periods, spring, summer and fall. The museum opened in summer, which meant people who visited the spring edition couldn't see the museum. So we turned the whole construction into a performance and disclosed every part of the construction available to see across the red glass. This is a view of making the tile painting at the bottom of the river which flows in the garden and also bottom of the glass floor in the museum. We did this as a workshop involving residents from children to grown-ups, everyone who was interested in attending. The workshop was held in a hall of a junior high school nearby. I wanted the museum to be felt that it was made by the hands by everyone and planned this workshop together with our clients. This is a mochimaki event, a traditional ceremony 
in Japan where rice cakes are thrown, wishing for good luck when a building is newly built. Again, this was held for the purpose of the museum to be felt that it was for everyone on the island. This last project, the Tashima Yoko House, also has a five minute video, which I would like to show now.
As a conclusion of my presentation, I would like to introduce my latest and largest project that my office is currently working on. Miranoza is a high-rise skyscraper in Kabukicho, Shinjuku, in the heart of Tokyo. The whole skyscraper will be filled with entertainment facilities, including a hotel, club, cinema, shops, and many others. This is how it will be looking like. The image is a fountain, based on the fact that Kabukicho used to be a pond. In the 50s and 60s, during the recovery and reconstruction after the war, Kabukicho used to aim to be a hub for entertainment in a healthy context. However, after decades, it went through a period of being renowned as a red light district area. The Japanese government now emphasizes in putting strong focus in the entertainment field, as it aims to have strength in tourism, as it believes our culture has a strong potential in that field. This area has very heavy restrictions of building high rises, but this project is specially allowed allowed by the Japanese government, as it will be a project focusing on entertainment. One of the requirements of this competition was being a female architect. High-rise skyscrapers used to have masculine male-dominant expressions, but I felt the government is putting focus in making a change. Please do look forward to the completion of this project, which is scheduled in 2022. I hope this place will be functioning as a fountain, circulating our existing potentials of culture. Thank you very much for enjoying my presentation.